In our last video, we talked about what is science? What does it mean to have a scientific study? What does it mean to set up controls and to test a hypothesis? What makes a good hypothesis versus a bad hypothesis? What is a theory? All that kind of great stuff. And biology is the scientific study of life. So now that we've dealt with that first part of the definition of biology, we can talk about the life part. What do we mean when we say life? How do we know whether or not something is alive? Now, that seems like a question that should have a pretty obvious, simple definition. If I show you uh, an organism, you should be able to say, yeah, yeah, that's alive. We have this sort of intuitive sense of what it means to be alive. But uh, as it turns out, if you try to actually write out what life is, if you try to come up with a definition for life, it's really hard to do. And the reason it's hard to do is because there are many objects, many things in the universe that have some of the properties that we would associate with living things, but not all of the properties. And there are some criteria of life that we might think are common sense, but that some living things don't actually have. So you might say living things move, right? That's something I would expect a living thing to be able to do is to move around. But, you know, trees don't move. They grow, but they don't really move once they've uh, become planted. So movement is not necessarily a indicator of life. And there's lots of things that move that are not alive. Clouds move, right? So you need to come up with a list of criteria that very, very carefully includes everything that is alive, but excludes everything that's not alive. And scientists have landed on seven features that all living things must possess. The first four of them are up on this slide. Criteria number one, order. Living things are orderly. What does that mean? It means that they have a structure, and that that structure makes sense. It informs how their bodies function, how their systems integrate together. And the structure of their bodies is going to be somewhat predictable. Like if I dissect uh, uh, any given human being, I know where I'm going to find its heart. And I know that heart is going to have four valves. I know where I'm going to find certain muscles. I know where certain bones are going to be and how they're going to be shaped. We have very, very orderly bodies in that sense. And the reason why our bodies have to be orderly is because bodies are living systems. Systems have interconnected parts and each one of those parts has a special function. And if any of your body parts are misshapen, it's not going to function very properly. Imagine someone born with a heart two sizes too small or too large to bring Dr. Seuss in on this. So you take a look at this pangolin, right? And it's got these scales on it. And look how these scales are layered. They're not going every which way randomly all over the place. They're actually in a very, very orderly pattern with every single layer laying over top the one just behind it. And the reason for that is if the scales were going absolutely every which way, then it wouldn't be able to move its arms and legs very well. Each scale would kind of be jutting out at odd angles and it wouldn't be able to bend its elbow or bring its knee up or something like that. They would catch on each other. The scales help it with protection. A predator comes and swipes at it and you got several layers of scales protecting their softer tissue below. So this is a very orderly, predictable system. The pine cone uses the same kind of arrangement for a very different reason. So you can see these two kind of look similar to each other, even though they're very distantly uh, related. Pine cones are a reproductive structure that you find on certain types of plants. You have male cones that open up and release pollen, female cones that open up and receive pollen. That opening up happens when these scales change their position. They change their angles so that the whole thing kind of... Whoosh, uh, folds out on itself. Just like with the pangolin, the arrangement of these scales isn't random. It's very, very orderly because if it was random, it wouldn't be able to open up so easily. It would remain closed and then the plant, it wouldn't be able to reproduce as a result. So living things have to be orderly. You expect certain organs to show up in certain shapes and the shape of that organ informs how it functions. We call this the complementarity of structure and function. But order goes even deeper. If you take uh, this pangolin or myself and you were to draw a line straight down the center of us, we would be symmetrical. Uh, one eye on the left, one eye on the right. One ear on the left, one ear on the right. We are bilaterally symmetrical. That is an orderly 
appearance. This pine cone is, well, you could call it bilaterally symmetric because you can cut it down the center, but actually you can cut it in any direction that you want and you'll get two equal halves. As long as it's going down that central axis, we call that radial symmetry. So symmetry is part of this order criteria of life. And there's another criteria uh, that is kind of tied in with this order concept, and that is living things are made out of cells. Cells are these individual living building blocks. It's the smallest bit of matter that can be considered alive, and we'll talk about how individual cells have all of these criteria in and of themselves. But kind of an unofficial, let's say, criteria of life is that living things have to be made out of cells. So even way, way, way down on a microscopic level, these organisms have this orderly structure. I know exactly what their arrangement of their cells is going to be, and I know what's going to be inside every single one of those cells. And that uh, structure, that order, allows this biological organism to function properly, to maintain their homeostasis, which happens to be the next criteria. So if we take a look at this iguana in the upper right-hand corner of the slide, what's he doing? He's sunning himself. If you guys have ever uh, had any experience with reptiles or maybe owned one yourself, Reptiles are what, usually they're called cold-blooded. If you're a biologist, you would say that they are ectothermic. Their body temperature is uh, related to the temperature outside rather than internally regulated at a certain temperature range. And that means that when they feel cold, they have to move someplace where they can get warmed up. They have to behaviorally regulate their body temperature. And their body temperature is part of this idea that we call homeostasis. When an organism is in homeostasis, all of the conditions inside their body, all of the numbers are just right. What do I mean by numbers? There's a lot of things you gotta keep track of as a living thing, right? If your blood pressure goes too low, you're, you're gonna die. If it goes too high, it's gonna damage your blood vessels. It's gonna cause long-term issue and you can get organ failure that way as well. So either too high or too low leads to death of the organism. Living organisms have to regulate their uh, homeostasis in order to stay alive because those that don't aren't alive very long and there's other things to keep track of as well so we got temperature we got blood pressure your blood sugar levels your body regulates that using various hormones if your blood sugars too low then you release glucagon into your system and that's gonna uh, increase the amount of blood sugar that you have if it's too high you should be uh, releasing insulin into your system which would cause some of your cells and tissues to reabsorb some of that blood sugar back in that's another kind of number you gotta keep track of and this is because living organisms are systems so we have orderliness, right? All the parts have to fit together, all the parts have to work, and then regulation is the maintenance of those parts, the maintaining of homeostasis. Because any system, even non-living systems, say an engine, if you don't maintain uh, the parts, they aren't going to last very long. If you don't put oil in your car, what's going to happen? You're, you're going to destroy your car as a result. So living things have to be orderly, and they need to regulate their internal environments. And the next criteria we can talk about is that they need to grow and develop. Now, I haven't met any of you yet. I don't know you very well, but I'm going to make some very, very bold assumptions about each and every one of you. I assume that you all started life as a single fertilized egg, a single-celled organism, and that gradually you started creating more and more cells and you got larger and larger and eventually you were born and then once you were born you didn't stop growing and developing you continued to grow and develop on up into adulthood uh, and when i say grow and develop babies don't just get larger and larger right we also change what we look like fundamentally as we continue uh, to age and get older if you were to take a picture of a baby and, and a picture of an adult man, and you put them right next to each other, and even though they're the same size because it's a picture, you would not be confused about which one is which, right? Because a baby would have like a giant head and those chubby arms and all these kind of things. They look fundamentally different from our adult forms. 
all living organisms go through this process of growth and development. Even the single-celled ones, even single-celled organisms have to put on cellular mass before they can divide themselves and make more individuals of their species. Here I have a butterfly undergoing metamorphosis. This is a very dramatic example of growth and development. So starting out life as a little caterpillar and they just eat more and more and more leaves. You put on more and more and more biomass, more body mass. You get more cells in your body in order to increase in size. And eventually Eventually, they go through this very dramatic change of metamorphosis in order to fundamentally become a, essentially a completely different looking kind of animal. If I showed you a butterfly and a caterpillar and you didn't know about metamorphosis, you would not think that they are the same animal, but they are. But all organisms go through this growth and development process. Maybe not as like sudden and dramatic as the change to a butterfly, but all of us do one way or another. Another feature that living organisms have to exhibit is energy utilization. Now I've said this already a couple of times, but living organisms are systems and systems have interconnected parts and systems do stuff. They have to move around. They have to get work done and your body does a lot of work constantly and work, ask any engineer or physicist, requires energy. Now different types of organisms get their energy from different locations. So it's not just eating food that we're talking about, like this puffin, He's going to meet his energy requirements with this mouthful of fish that he has, but a plant like I have in my office here, it's going to meet its energy needs through photosynthesis. It's going to use non-living sources of energy, the sun, sunlight, in order to be able to get enough energy in order to grow and maintain homeostasis and put all of its parts together and do work. Animals have to eat other organisms in order to survive. Now those organisms don't have to be other animals like this puffin is eating fish. It could, you could be talking about herbivores eating plants or something like that, but animals can't do photosynthesis. They can't make energy from non-living sources. So energy utilization, one way or another, has to uh, occur in order for us to consider something to be alive. All right, next slide. I said there were seven criteria, not four, so we got three more to go here. Response to the environment. If I were to put just something in front of you and I said, is this alive? You know, how would you know? I think a lot of you, your first idea about how to figure it out might be to just poke it and see what happens, right? Living things react to the world around them. So here I have this uh, dragonfly, and this dragonfly has reacted to the world around it. It was flying around, you know, sniffing the air, and it caught a whiff of something that it rather liked, something that smelled interesting, some pheromones in the air. So it came in to investigate. Uh, it responded to the stimuli of the smell that it received, and it responded by changing its behavior in response to that stimuli. So this is an important distinction. When I say response to the environment, I'm not talking about trivial responses, right? Like if I kick a rock with my foot, we can consider my foot to be the stimulus and the response of the rock is to fly across the room or roll away or something like that. But that's just a basic physics type response, right? That's not an interesting response. When I say response to the environment, I mean that the organism behaves in some way, that it responds in a complex way. It responds in an interesting way. So this dragonfly changing its flight path Pattern in response to smelling these chemicals, that was a complicated response. It required the interaction of, you know, sensors inside of its its equivalent of a nose and its neurons to communicate messages to uh, its system and then its muscles to change how they were behaving. All these kind of responses. This plant also can respond to the environment. In this case, the stimulus that it's responding to is the dragonfly. Some of you probably know that this is a Venus flytrap, and Venus flytraps show up in areas with nutrient poor soil. They, they can't get nutrients just from the soil. They need to look elsewhere in order to get like nitrogen and phosphorus uh, into their system. And where they look is insects. So they will emit smells into the air that will interest certain types of insects and they will change course to investigate. And now the plant can't feel the dragonfly. It can't see the dragonfly. It doesn't have any eyes, but it does have these hairs. You may or may not be able to see them on your monitor. When I do this uh, on a projector, you usually can't see them, but just underneath the dragonfly in the red parts of the Venus flytrap, you get these tiny little trigger hairs. And if the dragonfly touches 
two of those trigger hairs within a very short time frame of each other, a few seconds, then that is going to trigger a physiological response in the Venus flytrap, which will cause water to change where it is in there, and in a hydraulic uh, system kind of way, it's going to end up closing uh, these two leaves over each other, trapping the dragonfly, and it holds the dragonfly there until it dies, and it's able to absorb nutrition from that dragonfly. So this plant can respond to the environment as well. The next criteria of life that's on this slide is reproduction. Now reproduction is a necessary quality of living things for this reason. I've mentioned before already that living things are systems. Systems have interacting parts. Systems utilize energy. Systems do work. But in the real world, physics put certain constraints on systems. No system can run forever. You can't build a perpetual motion machine. Eventually, parts wear out, things break down, homeostasis will be lost, and we will all perish. Not to bring the mood down 15, 17 minutes into the presentation, but it is a fact. And yet, life has existed on Earth for three and a half billion years. So if all systems break down and die, how is life still here? Because of reproduction. Because organisms have the capacity to copy themselves. Now, much like with growth, where you just make more and more cells, and that's how you get larger and larger as an organism, reproduction has to do with cellular replication as well. Single-celled organisms can duplicate themselves. Some organisms reproduce what we call asexually. They don't need a partner to do it, they just make a genetic duplicate of themselves. Other organisms like us and like this lioness reproduce sexually. So she finds a partner, they mix their genes together, and they get offspring that are genetically unique, brand new individuals unlike any that has ever before seen uh, on this planet. Now, sexual and asexual reproduction both have advantages and disadvantages, which I'll talk about way later on in the course. But the upshot is that living things have to be able to reproduce themselves because if they cannot, then they are a genetic dead end. So living things, if they're here, they come from a long line of reproducers, successful reproducers, and therefore uh, reproduction is one of those criteria of life. So what is evolution? Evolution is kind of a byproduct of reproduction. I mentioned that physics places certain constraints on living systems. We can't live forever, and we also can't copy ourselves perfectly. Just like a Xerox machine can't copy something completely perfectly, you're going to get these little errors. Same in biological systems. You can't perfectly copy something forever. And when errors in DNA replication, errors in replication, reproduction occur, in biology you refer to those as mutations. And mutations change the way that your proteins inside your cells, and we'll talk more about proteins later, uh, it changes the way that they're shaped, and the shape tells you about the function, just like with that pangolin and its scales. Change the shape, change the function. So if you change the function as an organism is developing over the course of their life, you're going to change what the adult organism ends up looking like. So one little tweak to your DNA and you might end up with a larger nose, for instance. Or you might end up with freckles versus no freckles. Or you might end up with ligaments that are a little bit stretchier than most people's ligaments. Tiny little tweaks to DNA can change features in the adult organism. Now, mutations are random. They're random little changes. If there are any changes that occur that are catastrophically bad, that just the organism cannot function, well, that organism's not going to live very long. It might never develop in the first place, so you won't see too many of those popping up because they will be at a survival disadvantage, and particularly out in nature when you have predators looking for any kind of, uh, you know, weak prey to pick off, they're going to be eliminated pretty fast. But if any of those little tweaks happen to make an organism better adapted to its local environment, which could mean a lot of things, different environments require different traits, then that is going to give them an advantage. And no matter what kind of advantage it is, if it's an advantage that helps them blend in and avoid predators, or it makes them a better hunter, better at gathering food, or it allows them to digest a new f source of nutrition, that maybe they can digest a berry that their brothers and sisters aren't able to digest, whatever that advantage is, if it translates into them being a more successful reproducer, that's something evolution can work with. So what do I mean by a more successful reproducer? 
if this katydid down here blends in with the leaves better than its brothers and sisters do, well, when birds are looking for a meal, they're gonna pick off his brothers and sisters and not this particular katydid. So his genes are the ones that are gonna show up in the gene pool of the next generation. And if his genes included a mutation that gave him that advantage of blending in, then the next generation is gonna have more copies of that mutation. It's gonna look more like him than it did like his brothers and sisters that got eaten by the birds. Any kind of advantage that you have in nature can translate ultimately into a reproductive advantage. If you're better at gathering food, better at avoiding predators, all these things that I listed. If it means as a consequence you have more offspring, then that is a adaptation that natural selection can work with. So evolution is a change in how common certain genes are in a species or in a population generation by generation. And on that definition, individuals can evolve. Individuals can have mutations, but they can't themselves evolve. But because there's so much competition out there in nature, all living organisms change over time. These populations will have different traits as we move forward. And since you cannot copy any genome perfectly generation by generation, the only thing that a biologist can guarantee for a population moving into the future is that it will inevitably change. So let's do this. Take a look at these three pictures. In the first picture, we have fire. In the second picture, we have uh, viruses. This is an electron micrograph of a particular kind of virus called a bacteriophage. And in the third picture, we have something that you might find outside. Who knows what it is? Maybe it's a living organism. Maybe my dog ate some uh, eggs this morning and I took a picture of the aftermath. Who knows? For the first two, write down whether or not you believe they are alive and if they are not alive, which criteria of life would you say that they do possess and do not possess? For the third picture, consider what kind of experiment you might devise in order to determine whether or not it is alive based on what we've learned so far. What could you test about this substance? So take a moment, pause the video, and then I'll come back and talk you through it. Okay, so first up we have fire. Scientifically speaking, fire is not considered to be alive. That said though, it does have some of these properties of life that we discussed. Does fire grow? Yes, fire does grow. You can start a little tiny fire and then it becomes a huge, huge, huge fire. And fire grows much faster than we would like it to. Does fire utilize energy? Well, what is it doing? Well, it's consuming this wood and this wood is full of carbohydrates. Wood is mostly made out of sugars. We'll talk about that a little bit later, and it's burning the energy inside those sugars in order to produce light and heat. So it's converting the energy from one form into another. So yeah, it is in fact utilizing energy. Can fire reproduce? Can I take one fire and make it two fires and use those two fires to make three fires or four fires? Yes, I absolutely can. So it can reproduce as well. But is fire orderly? No, it, it really isn't. It's not symmetric. I, I can't draw a line through it and get a perfect uh, symmetrical two halves of a fire. It's kind of amorphous. It's not made out of cells. I can't dissect it and say, oh, here's one organ or another organ, and this is where I expect it to find. It's not an orderly thing. It's more of a constantly shifting mass of freely moving particles. Fire doesn't maintain homeostasis either. I mean, I can add more fuel or more oxygen and increase uh, the heat of the fire, or if these things are depleted, it will decrease the heat in response, but it doesn't have any kind of feedback mechanism in order to control its own internal environment. It's just kind of at the whims of its environment, so it doesn't regulate itself. It doesn't respond to the environment in an interesting way. Sure, the wind could blow and that could cause the fire to spread, but that's, again, that kind of basic physics push-pull kind of response. When we talk about response to the environment, we mean a complex response. We mean a behavior. And although fire seems to behave sometimes, if it gets really out of control, it really is just moving along with the general rules of physics. And we can't make it change its behavior in any way. Does fire evolve? It reproduces, so does it evolve? No, because it has no genetic material like DNA in order to determine what kind of traits it has. So there's nothing to change. There's nothing to alter 
uh, in future generations of fire. Fire has been the same since the very beginning of the universe. Okay, so fire doesn't meet the criteria of life. So what about these viruses? Are they alive? Now, you might think that viruses are alive because they have DNA in them and they have protein in them, all these kind of molecules that you would expect inside an organic system. And they also reproduce and they evolve and they have a very orderly structure. So they have those three criteria of life taken care of, but most biologists do not consider viruses to be a living thing. They are orderly. They have a protein code on the outside, which has a very particular structure, and it contains DNA on the inside, but they're not made out of cells. Viruses are much, much, much smaller than cells. And like I said, one of the unofficial criteria of life is that it has to be made out of cells. Viruses can reproduce themselves. However, they can't reproduce on their own. They require uh, a host. What viruses often do is they inject their DNA into another cell. That's what these bacteriophages are doing. They're injecting their DNA into a bacterium and they use the reproductive machinery of that host cell in order to make more copies of the virus. So they reproduce in a kind of parasitic way. They evolve. We have new versions of the flu virus every single year. Where these novel viruses come from? It's an evolutionary process. Every single time new viruses get made, there's some changes to that genetic code. They reproduce through DNA just like we reproduce through DNA. And any changes that make it more virulent, a, a better virus at uh, spreading from person to person, well, obviously that's going to be a huge advantage. So you're going to see more and more and more of those successful reproducers. So virus do evolve and we get new strains all the time. This is why we have COVID-19, a, a version of coronavirus that was first categorized in 2019. That's why they keep saying it's a novel virus. But just because something evolves doesn't necessarily mean it's alive. Doesn't meet any of the other criteria. Not so much. Viruses don't grow. They are assembled by the machinery of the cells that they've hijacked. But once they are built, that's it. That's the only size that they will ever be. They don't grow and develop over time. They do not uh, regulate their internal body environment. They don't have any kind of systems in place for maintaining homeostasis. They don't utilize energy. They don't eat any food. They don't do photosynthesis or anything like that. So they don't have complex moving parts that do a lot of work. They just sort of float around and wait to bump into the host cell that they'll be able to replicate in. And they don't respond to the environment. They just sort of float around wherever it is they're going to go. So they don't behave in complicated ways either. And therefore we say that viruses are not alive. Even though sometimes we talk about them like they're alive, like we say that, you know, this uh, disinfectant will kill 99.9% .9 of viruses, right? How could you kill something that's not alive in the first place? But that's just kind of the fundamental limitation of language that we have to describe things. It's more convenient to talk about them like that. And then finally, we have this yellow goop down here. How would you be able to tell if this is alive? Well, one way you might be able to tell is if you took a sample of it and you placed it somewhere else and then you saw if that continued to grow. So you'd be able to see if it could reproduce itself and you'd be able to see if it put on mass over time. That would be two of our criteria of life. You could try putting a sample of it on different types of nutrients to see if it's utilizing energy, if it likes sugar or wood or anything like that, if it's digesting material to gain energy. You could take a look at it under a microscope and see if it's made out of cells. That would be a good idea to see whether or not it's a living thing. And in fact, this is a living thing. This is what we call a slime mold, which is a type of protist. A protist is not an animal, it's not a fungus, it's not a plant, and it's not a bacterium. It's its own kind of organism, but it is nonetheless alive. I'm going to link a video in the description uh, that I rather like that shows slime molds being able to solve mazes and that sort of thing. So you can get a sense of that this is really a living organism.